Welcome everybody, it's Jerry Ryder um, speaking uh, from Anne. I'm sitting in for Karen Visser today who's unfortunately unwell, but it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the webinar today and particularly to welcome Doug, Rahul and Dave who are going to be presenting with us this morning. So today's session is, uh, as, as the title suggests, it's in our data citation series. It's the second in our data citation series and we have four in the um, series altogether. This one is um, going to be a, a really interesting session because it's um, some real case studies from um, the Australian National University and the Australian Antarctic Division about their um, journeys, if you like, in um, implementing DOIs and data citation at their um, institutions. Um, we'll start off with the uh, with a presentation from um, Doug Monker, who's the repository manager at ANU. Then he'll hand over to his colleague Rahul, who's a systems developer at ANU, uh, to talk about their experiences. Then um, we'll hand over to Dave Connell um, down in Hobart at the Australian Antarctic Division um, to talk about the experiences at um, AAD and then um, we can come back to some question time after that. Okay, um, well hello everybody. My name is Dave Connell. I um, work at the Australian Antarctic Division. I'm in a section of the, uh, the AAD called the Australian Antarctic Data Centre and our job is basically to look after all of the, um, the data that we collect from our scientific program. So here's our little case study. Um, I thought I should start off with a bit of um, background information about um, the AAD and the Antarctic, so sort of give you a bit of an idea of, of sort of what we're dealing with. Um, basically, science has been uh, has been very prominent in the Antarctic over the last century, perhaps a bit more so than exploration, as what tend to, people tend to think of most, I guess, when they first think of the Antarctic. Um, one thing that's probably little known is that is that Douglas Mawson was actually offered a spot on Scott's um, trip to, to connect to the South Pole first, but he turned it down in favour of running a scientific expedition instead, and that sort of pretty much kick-started the whole Australian sort of science process down there. Uh, there've been there's quite a lot of international sort of science that goes on as well, and that all sort of culminated in, in signing the Antarctic Treaty in the 90, in 1961, which was originally by 50 nations. And it's still running today. It's one of the longest-running international um, treaties um, going around. And one of the uh, the tenets of that was that all scientific data needed to be made free and open um, to anybody who wanted it. And that's sort of one of the sort of the real sort of foundation stones, I guess, of our, of our, of our data centre. It sort of gives us our mandate for going and getting everybody's data and pushing it out to the world. Uh, some other things about Antarctica. Obviously, it's a long, long way away. Uh, it takes about a week to get there um, in a ship uh, from from Hobart, um, or about six hours in a commercial jet. So it's, it takes a bit of a, a little bit of your time to, to get there and back. But that tends to make it very expensive. It can cost anywhere between many thousands of dollars to send somebody down for a few weeks, or hundreds of thousands of dollars to send them down for a year. So if you go into all that sort of trouble, then you want to make sure you look after your data appropriately. Uh, here at the AED, we have a multi-themed science program. Uh, with, with many hundreds of scientists involved um, who are not just based here but they're also at universities across the country, um, around the world and also for other state and federal um, government organisations. Over this last year we had 60 projects um, running for the summer um, and all of those projects will generate data which has to be collected, managed and, and published uh, by our little section. So basically we do a lot of different science and there's an awful lot of it to keep track of and then we've got to make it all available to the world you know, whenever everybody wants it via download or via other distribution services if, um, if possible um, and it'll cost a lot of money so we don't really want to have to waste um, any of our data by having to go collect it again. So that sort of brings us around to DOIs and sort of and where we're sort of you know going with that. Uh, we made the decision last year that we needed to start creating DOIs for our data sets and obviously, if you're going to create DOIs for data sets in Australia, then you need to talk to ANT. So we approach them for assistance, and they pointed us in the right direction. Um, shows which paperwork we had to fill out and what sort of you know, things were required 
um, in order for us to start creating them. We did briefly think about creating do, um, DOIs for our metadata records as well, but decided against that in the end as it was perhaps a little bit of overkill um, and wasn't sort of really sort of going down the, down the right sort of road. Uh, we figured just you know, having them for data sets was enough, even though the metadata standards that we use actually have a, a spot where we could put a DOI for our metadata records into. Uh, we did anticipate back in 2012 that there would be a strong level of interest from all of our scientists in getting DOIs for, um, for their data sets. So we, we figured this was certainly going to be you know, the right thing to do and we were trying to you know, sort of do the right thing by scientists as well and also provide them with a service that we thought was going to be um, amazing. Um, and then finally, after getting around um, through all the, jumping through all the hoops and hurdles and like, we moved our first DOI um, earlier this year at the end of, the end of January. Okay, so there So our little rules and guidelines that we have, we we don't automatically create DOIs for all of our data sets, which is um, something that I know that CSIRO do. Well, at least I think that's what CSIRO do. I could be correct if I'm wrong. Um, and many other people are probably are possibly thinking about doing that. Uh, we decided against that and decided to put the onus back onto the scientists um, to request a DOI for their data set. Uh, so if they wanted one, then they would sort of come come to us. Uh, the only exception we made to that was that if, for example, a user was out there who had found a data set and said, look, I want to use this this data for my work, I want to correctly cite it, does it have a DOI? And in that case, we would then sort of go back to the scientist and say, look, somebody wants to use your data, we'd like to make a DOI for it. Is that okay? And generally, that sort of thing is so far as where it's happened once and it was it worked out quite acceptably. Uh, we also, one of our other business rules is that we only create DOIs for stable data sets, um, which is why I guess one of the reasons why we don't create automatically create DOIs for everything. We wanted to make sure that the data set that we were creating a DOI for had was finished, and it was all done. Um, there, was, there weren't likely to be any more updates to it. Uh, also, the da data had to be um, publicly available. Uh, we didn't want to, because quite a, a chunk of our data is still sort of locked away. Um, some of it's because the scientists are still working on it, they haven't finished publishing yet. So we want to, obviously we don't release publicly release data that they're still using. Um, and many of our other data sets are uh, commercial and confidence. Um, things like, uh, things like um, phishing data and the like. So. Um, also, the last sort of rule that we initially decided on was that there had to be a one-to-one -one relationship between our metadata records and our data sets. Um, this is sort of because the way we've sort of gone with this, even though the DOI is for the data set, we're actually attaching it to the metadata record because the metadata record describes the data set and that was sort of the easiest way for us to be able to organise it. Um, as a result, sort of some of our metadata records actually link to several data sets. Um, this is just how the scientists like to organise their things. Um, but in the case of DOIs, we decided that because of the way, the fact that the DOI is actually going to be attached to the metadata record, we had to have only one data set in each metadata record. And so far, that's that hasn't been a problem. It's been working out okay. Okay, so getting our little message out there. So first of all. Back in December of last year, uh, once once we had become an official sort of, um, part of, of data site or ANS, I guess, um, so that we could create DOIs, we put a little press release out um, around our organisation to say that we could now create DOIs for everybody. And then we sort of sat back and waited for the influx of, of, of DOI requests. And then we waited a bit more, and then we waited a little bit more again. And eventually, we had one single request, which came out in end of January 2013. So we decided that this little approach of just waiting for the scientists to come to us was was perhaps not as useful as it as, as we thought it would have been. So what we decided to do was to beat the bushes a little bit. So when scientists were submitting data to us, because we now have that sort of fairly well entrenched with them, they they understand now that when they create their data sets, they then hand it over. So when we did, when they did that, and if we knew that, the, and if they indicated that the data could be made public, then we would ask them, "Would you like a DOI for your data set?" And generally, once we'd actually explained them, they sort of went, "Oh, that's a great idea! I would love to have a DOI for my data set." 
Um, the other thing that, that we found that this also did was that when, when scientists were finishing up their projects and they were handing their data in to us, um, we would ask them if they wanted a DOI and at the same time we could sort of say, oh, by the way, if you want a DOI, you have to make your data public, um, something that's often been a little bit slow to happen, but because they were sort of suddenly sort of dazzled with the, um, the magical properties of a, of a data set DOI, they were uh, agreed to make their data public sort of not that much sooner, so that worked out quite well for us. Uh, one of the things that I guess we're hoping for with data set DOIs is that eventually they'll obtain sort of like a critical mass in our organisation, much like uh, metadata records uh, did, I guess. I, I've been here at the IAD for about 15 and a half years now, working on metadata for most of that time, probably about 14 of those years. Um, and when I first started doing metadata here, it was, it was a really hard slog. Um, people weren't interested in it, they didn't want to do it, they viewed it as an, as an unnecessary overhead and it was just a waste of their time. But eventually as we had to keep persisting and, and that the, collect, the metadata collection grew and it got to, got to a certain point that suddenly it started becoming very useful and after that my job got a lot easier and people started handing their metadata in and their data sets in to do that without being prompted. And we're hoping that something like that will happen with the DOIs so that once they start seeing the data set DOIs out there um, and around and in papers and in publications and on websites and stuff that they will start coming to us more rather than us having to go to them. One of the other things that I guess we're also trying to sort of um, entice them with is, um, is the ability to track their data sets. Um, something we're not really set up with yet but we're hoping that will become sort of more sort of common in the future so they can then see who else has been using their data and where else it's gone. Okay, so this is still also part of our little message. Um, one of the things we thought we should we should do is create a little DI logo. Uh, we haven't done this yet, but this is a little screenshot of, of what it, the sort of thing that we were, we were thinking of. Um, this is a little snapshot of our homepage. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse on the screen or not, but I'm just going to wave it around in case you do and get rid of that thing. But down here, so in one section of our website, we have this little latest editions section. Um, one side is always devoted to maps, and one side is always devoted to data. And what we were thinking of doing is that every time a da one of these data things appears that has a data set DOI, we'd stick a little DOI logo that's on the top little corner. So that suddenly it gets a bit more exposure on our homepage, and people are seeing it a lot more. And actually, up here at the top, you can see the little press release on the 30th of December 2012. That's when we sent out our will notice saying, we've got DOIs, come and get them. Um, the other parts we do, um, as far as our DOI message, is we're trying to get in with a bit of early education. So for all the projects that our scientists um, apply to do, they they have to create a data management plan. So if this is a very new thing, we've only just started it this last season, and all projects in the future will be using these and part of the data management plan is this little bit on the screen you can see here. It's just a little bit of education. It sort of um, lets them know that, that we can create DOIs for their data sets once they're finished and about sort of correctly citing their data. And we have a little um, checkbox in there that um, asks them if they would like to be able to you know, correctly cite their data once they're, once they're finished. And we have that set um, to yes by default. And I'm, hanging on, I'm just going to cough for a moment. <coughs> Okay, sorry about that. Um, and at the moment, this is just really, like I said, this is just education. So it, it just doesn't isn't tying them into anything yet because they're writing these plans before they've even collected any data. So we're not expecting to see any data from this for another couple of years. But at which point we can then at least go back and say, well, look, you said you wanted a DOI, and let's get on with it. Okay, so just got a few quick screenshots of some of the tools that we've put in place. So at the moment, anybody can request a DOI for, um, for for one of our data sets, but only I can approve them at the moment. So what happens is that somebody would come to our website, um, preferably the scientist in question who wants to get a DOI for their own data set, and they will search for their um, search for their data set, and then they'll get um, arrive on this little page, which will ask them to formally request a DOI. And we provide a little bit of information here as to what um, to what happens after they do that and also how their little citation will look. So what happens then is that the request comes to me and I've got a couple more screenshots here. Uh, the one at the top you can see is part of my little um, 
admin page, and I can see on the left you know, the, what the data set is, who's requested it, in which case this one was requested by me, it's just a, a dummy one, um, and also a date and a time. And you might notice that there's a slight bug with the, um, with the, the, the date, which we haven't quite <laughs> sorted out yet, as I'm pretty sure I didn't request that in 1970. Um, then over on the right, I can either delete the request if I decided it's it's not it's not a legitimate request, or if somebody's just testing the system. Um, and if it's okay, then I will submit submit the right request off to AMS. Uh, one thing I do before I have to um, I submit that request to AMS is I have to go check the metadata record to make sure that it has all of the appropriate fields in it that data site require. Um, usually, there's one missing. Uh, from our records, which hasn't sort of tr traditionally been entered, and that was the data set release date. So usually I tend to go and, and enter that in before I submit the request. Um, if I submit the request and it doesn't have any of the all, all of the required fields, then I'll get a little error message back telling me what's missing. So let's fix it. Um, so then once I get uh, once I submit that request off, I get the um, I get the DOI back instantly. Which is very nice, and then I can go put that insert in, insert that into the metadata record, and then load it into our, into our database. Um, down the bottom of the screen, there you can see um, a few uh, data sets for which we have DOIs for. You can see the DOIs are listed listed out there, um, and also I have the other tools there for being able to deactivate these DOIs or update them if the metadata records um, or data sets um, slightly change. Okay, so. Obviously, if you're going to have a DOI, you need to have a landing page. And this is just a section of one of ours. Um, so you can see, basically, up the top, the first thing we, we, we threw in was the citation. So the scientists could at least initially um, quickly see this is how I cite that data set. Um, there's a link to the data set on the right. And then we done sort of on the left and sort of down the page, we start moving through the, um, some of the basic metadata elements. Um, there are a few more that off the bottom of the screen that you can't see. And also, we provide a link to the um, to the full metadata record, which is um, on our metadata catalog. Okay, so basically, where we stand now. So at the moment, um, after having been available for DOIs, I guess here for for a few months, we currently have 17 of them in our system. Um, a few of those have been user requested, but most of them um, have come about because I've approached the scientists and said, look. If you finish this off now, would you like a DOI for your data set? Um, there is a strong level of interest in data set DOIs, but this most seems to be mostly once they know about them. Um, so at the moment, many scientists seem to be blissfully unaware of them, but once they actually find out that we can we can create them and then and what they're for, then they're generally very excited about it because I think anything that involves citing their data, they, they tend to quite enjoy. Um, so we do expect to get quite a lot more of these in the future. Um, so as I just said, the biggest problem is a lack of awareness from our scientists. Um, but they do know about DOIs for publications, so they are at least aware of what a DOI is. It's, so it's not a foreign concept to them. And luckily um, for us, we're not the only drivers of, of getting DOIs for data sets. As many journals are now asking um, scientists to submit their data as well as as a paper. So that often sort of area comes to the requirement of getting a DOI too, or it's always or it's something that scientists would like to have a DOI for their data set before they submit it to their journals. Okay, so that's basically sort of where we're at 